that during the 2008 presidential campaign, Obama responded to charges that he was soft on Israel by pandering to the lobby and repeatedly praising the special relationship. In the month before he took office, he was silent during the Gaza massacre when Israel was being criticized around the world for its brutal assault on that densely populated enclave. After taking office in January 2009, President Obama and his principal foreign policy advisors began demanding that Israel stop all settlement building in the occupied territories, to include East Jerusalem, so that serious peace negotiations with the Palestinians could begin. After calling for two states for two people in his Cairo speech in June 2009, the president declared, it is time for these settlements to stop. Secretary of State Clinton had made the same point one month earlier when she said, we want to see a stop to settlement construction, additions, natural growth, any kind of settlement activity. That is what the president has called for. George Mitchell, the president's special envoy for the Middle East, conveyed this straightforward message to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and his lieutenants on numerous occasions. In response, Netanyahu made it equally clear that Israel intended to continue building settlements and that he and almost everyone in his ruling coalition opposed a two-state solution. He made but a single reference to two states in his own speech at bar -Alan University on June 14, 2009, and the conditions he attached to it made it clear that he was talking about giving the Palestinians a handful of disconnected, apartheid-style Bantustans not a fully sovereign state. Netanyahu, of course, won this fight. The Israeli Prime Minister not only refused to stop building the 2,500 housing units that were under construction in the West Bank at the time, but just to make it clear to Obama who was boss, in late June 2009, he authorized the building of 300 new homes in the West Bank. Netanyahu refused to even countenance any limits on settlement building in East Jerusalem, which is supposed to be the capital of a Palestinian state. By the end of September 2009, Obama publicly conceded that Netanyahu had beaten him in their fight over the settlements. The president falsely denied that freezing settlement construction had ever been a precondition for resuming the peace process. And instead, he meekly asked Israel to please exercise restraint while it continued colonizing the West Bank. Fully aware of his triumph, Netanyahu said on September 23rd, I am pleased that President Obama has accepted my approach that there should be no preconditions. Indeed, his victory was so complete that the Israeli media was full of stories describing how their prime minister had beaten Obama and greatly improved his shaky political position at home. For example, one journalist wrote in Ma'ariv, quote, in the past weeks, it has become clear with what ease an Israeli prime minister can succeed in thwarting an American initiative. Perhaps the best American response to Netanyahu's victory came from the widely read author and blogger Andrew Sullivan, who wrote that this sad episode should, quote, remind Obama of a cardinal rule of American politics. No pressure on Israel ever. Just keep giving them money and they will give the United States the finger in return. The only permitted position is to say you oppose settlements in the West Bank while doing everything you can to keep them growing and advancing. The Obama administration was engaged in a second round of fighting over settlements last month 
when the Netanyahu government embarrassed Vice President Biden during his visit to Israel by announcing plans to build 1,600 new housing units in East Jerusalem. While this crisis was important because it clearly revealed that Israel's brutal policies towards the Palestinians are seriously damaging American interests in the Middle East, Netanyahu rejected President Obama's request to stop building settlements in East Jerusalem. As far as we are concerned, he said on March 21st, of course that's of this year, building in Jerusalem is like building in Tel Aviv. Our policy on Jerusalem is like the policy in the past 42 years. One day later, at the annual APAC conference, Netanyahu said, the Jewish people were building Jerusalem 3,000 years ago, and the Jewish people are building Jerusalem today. Jerusalem is not a settlement. It is our capital. And just last week, he said, there will be no freeze in Jerusalem. Although it does appear that Israel is not building in East Jerusalem for the moment. Meanwhile, back in the United States, APAC got 333 congressmen and 76 senators to sign letters to Secretary of State Clinton reaffirming their unyielding support for Israel and urging the administration to keep future disagreements behind closed doors. In short, President Obama is no match for the lobby. The best he can hope for is to restart the so-called peace process. But most people understand that these negotiations are a charade. The two sides engage in endless talks while Israel, Israel continues to colonize Palestinian lands. Henry Siegman got it right when he called these fruitless talks the greater Middle East peace process scam. There are two other reasons why there's not going to be a two-state solution. The Palestinians are badly divided among themselves and not in a good position to make a deal and then stick to it. That problem is fixable with time and help from Israel and the United States. But time has run out and neither Jerusalem nor Washington is likely to provide a helping hand. Then there are the Christian Zionists, who are a powerful political force in the United States, especially on Capitol Hill. They are adamantly opposed to a two-state solution because they want Israel to control every square millimeter of Palestine, a situation they believe heralds the second coming of Christ. What this all means is that there's going to be a greater Israel between the Jordan and the Mediterranean. In fact, I would argue that it already exists. But who will live there and what kind of political system will it have? It is not going to be a democratic binational state, at least in the near future. An overwhelming majority of Israel's Jews have no interest in living in a state that would be dominated by the Palestinians. And that includes young Israeli Jews, many of whom hold clearly racist views towards Palestinians in their midst. Furthermore, few of Israel's supporters are in the United States are interested in this outcome, at least at this point in time. Most Palestinians, of course, would accept the democratic binational state without hesitation if it could be achieved quickly. But that is not going to happen, although, as I will argue shortly, it is likely to come to pass down the road. Then there is ethnic cleansing, which would certainly mean that greater Israel would have a Jewish majority. But that murderous strategy seems unlikely because it would do enormous damage to Israel's moral fabric, its relationship with Jews in the diaspora, and to its international standing. Israel and its supporters would be treated harshly by history and it would poison relation with Israel's neighbors for years to come. No genuine friend of Israel could support this policy, which would clearly be a crime against humanity. 
It also seems unlikely because most of the 5.5 million